and welcome back to part three. Let's keep trucking along. All right, acute respiratory distress. This is a life-threatening lung inflammation that results from direct injury to the lungs or from some type of systemic injury. It is gonna be diagnosed by bilateral alveolar infiltrates, the absence of left-sided heart failure and hypoxemia. The hypoxemia is diagnosed not by pulse ox, but by the PaO2, FiO2 ratio that is less than or equal to 200 for um, acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, or 300 for acute lung injury. So are we get, we're not gonna diagnose it by pulse ox, we're gonna have to draw blood gas. The pathophys, hallmark characteristic of this is increased permeability of the alveolar capillary membrane causing pulmonary edema. In the acute phase of acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, inflammatory mediators damage the membrane causing interstitial edema. Later, pneumocytes and fibrin infiltrate the damaged alveoli to start healing or the process of fibrosis. If fibrosis occurs, the mechanical ventilation may be indicated. Recall from the baby lecture what surfactant does. It lubricates the alveoli, right? So in ARDS, surfactant production is inactivated, so the lungs get stiff, which impairs gas exchange, and then you get swelling and congestive atelectasis. You end up with decreased residual capacity, pulmonary hypertension, and increased right-to-left shunting of pulmonary blood flow. The atelectasis is nice food for bacteria, right? So there's a bacterial pneumonia risk component to this as well. The hypoxia, or the increased work of breathing, usually indicates a need for mechanical ventilation. So, as a nurse, what are we watching for? If our patient has increased work of breathing and they become hypoxic, are we going to sit by and do nothing? No, we're going to be proactive. We're going to have to call our physician and report to them the entire clinical picture. We're going to gather our chart or we're going to have the chart open on the computer in front of us before we call the doctor so we can answer all their questions before because they probably need mechanical ventilation if they're having all the, those kinds of difficulties. Treatment. You gotta ventilate the lungs somehow. So usually we are going to sedate while patients are ventilated because it's terrifying to be intubated and on a vent and be awake. We're also going to give fluids. We're also going to probably be giving antibiotics. We're going to be monitoring our, our little pediatric patients for septic shock. We're going to maintain good cardiac output. How are we going to do that? Well, let's, let's see if you guys can figure it out. <laughs> fluids. I'll give you a hint. Fluids is one way we're going to maintain good cardiac output because if we maintain hydration, then we're going to maintain our blood pressure, then hopefully we can maintain good cardiac output. We're also going to start our patients on a proton pump inhibitor to prevent an ulcer. You guys, we all do that now, so that's not anything normal or abnormal. We may start them on TPN and lipids. We're going to provide comfort measures. Good mechanical ventilation is important. You don't want to dam further damage the lungs with barotrauma, so lower tidal volumes with some PEEP pressure is best. If your PIP or your peak inspiratory pressure is too high, then you can pop those alveoli and you're going to pop a lung. And it's never, it's, you're not going to get good gas exchange at all if you pop a lung. Some children may need inhaled nitric oxide because what does nitric oxide do? It dilates blood vessels, thus promoting gas exchange. Um, if kids are really sick, they may have to go on an oscillator vent or they may even require ECMO. And this slide just goes over what to look for for respiratory distress in babies. I like this graphic because it just kind of goes through and shows you guys again. When we talk about retractions, it's important to know where to look for them. So they can be supraclavicular, they can be substernal, they can be intercostal. You see intercostal retractions a lot. You can see substernal, subcostal. I see subcostal retractions a lot too. Um, so anyway, that's just a graphic to help you guys. All right, let's talk about asthma. If there was something that you should definitely know for boards, it would be asthma. If there was something you should definitely study for this exam, 
it would be asthma because if boards and Kaplan are going to test you on it, it's pretty much a surefire thing that I'm going to test you on it too. So I would study asthma a lot if I were you. Just a tip. Asthma is characterized by variable and the recurring symptoms of airflow obstruction. It is caused by bronchial hyperresponsiveness and basically underlying inflammation. This inflammation causes recurrent episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightening, and cough, especially at night or in the early morning. In 2009, there were 7.1 million children with asthma, and that's in 2009. 57.2% uh, reported an asthma attack in the last 12 months. Those children that missed at least one day of school because of asthma, with an average number of missed of 3.8 days. 32.5% of children made a visit to the ER because of asthma, and 8% of them ended up hospitalized. As of 2011, there are 174 deaths, deaths per year due to asthma. So asthma is divided into four categories. Those categories are meant to help with the management of asthma. So just want to kind of give you some info, info about that. There are more than 100 genes associated with the susceptibility and the pathogenesis of asthma. Environmental agents like secondhand smoke, pet dander, roach feces, recurrent viral respiratory illnesses, and allergens like hay fever, food allergies, eczema all contribute. Protective factors, this is good, include large families, <laughs> late birth order, so you know if you're the third or fourth kid that's protective. Uh, child care attendance, so yay, something positive for attending daycare. You, it lowers your risk of developing asthma. Um, having a dog in the family, which is interesting because pet dander increases your susceptibility, but then having a dog, a, you know, a dog in the family also decreases your risk. And living on a farm. Why is that? What do you notice about all those protective factors? Large families, that means lots of germs. Nothing against large families, but you know, where there's people, there's germs. So probably exposure to illnesses and exposure to things. Later birth order. So again, if you're the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth kid, yeah, you've been around, you know, a lot in your household as far as germs go. Child care attendance. Mm, this is a good one because that's lots of kids that you've been exposed to. Having a dog in the family, if you grow up with a dog in the family or a pet in the house, then that's kind of a good thing because that kind of tells your respiratory, it kind of helps prevent the respiratory tract from being so hypersensitive. Or I, sh I shouldn't say the respiratory tract, the immune system. And living on a farm because there's lots of germs on farms. Um, and not bad germs, it's just, there's just lots of, lots of pollen, lots of germs, lots of things to, um, you know, that if you have never been exposed to those things and then suddenly were, it would cause a very, um, it could cause a hypersensitive reaction. But if you grow up that way and, you buy, and your body has always been exposed to it, then that kind of protects you against developing asthma. It is hypothesized that these things increase the exposure to infections early on and that helps the child's immune system develop in a non-allergenic pathway. Yay! All right, let's talk about the pathophys of asthma for a minute. Inflammation causes the normal protective mechanisms, which would be mucus formation, mucosal swelling, and airway muscle contraction, coughing, right? Mucus, swelling, and coughing. Normal protective mechanisms to overreact in response to a stimulus. So instead of just saying, oh look, there's a germ, it goes red alert, red alert, like DEFCON 10, or gosh, I don't even know what it is, but the immune system like goes crazy over it. Triggers. The inflammation is caused from a trigger. The trigger activates the IgE in the mast cells, causes the release of histamines, leukotrienes, and prostaglandins. Triggers can increase, the, um, they increase the frequency and the severity of the smooth muscle contraction or the bronchospasms and the airway responsiveness. Triggers can be exercise, infectious agents, allergens, fragrances, food additives, pollutants, weather changes, or even strong emotions. 
These inflammatory uh, mediators release pro-inflammatory cytokines causing chronic airway inflammation associated with airway remodeling. Airway remodeling is associated with permanent damage that ultimately decreases the lung's elasticity and causes decreased lung function. If this happens, there's no treatment. Is it a good idea to change our body's structure and like remodel anything that's in there? Not generally, no. No. All right. So let's keep on with our pathophys because we're not quite done with it yet. Uh, so remember on the other slide I told you we have all these, you know, protective mechanisms. And so we end up with airway narrowing. It results from bronchial constriction, edema, and the copious amounts of mucus. Those are those protective mechanisms. When they're all activated, we end up with the narrower airways. Keep in mind, kids have smaller airways to begin with, so it doesn't take much to cause a big change in kids. Small airways are clogged, trapping air below the mucus plugs. Decreased perfusion of the alveolar capillaries results from hypoxic vasoconstriction and increased pressure due to hyperinflation of the alveoli. Hypoxia leads to an increased respiratory rate because our brain says, uh-oh, we don't have enough oxygen. What should we do? I know, we need to just breathe more. We need to breathe faster. So it tells our lungs to it, uh, kick up the respiratory rate, which results with reduced air volume because we have airway resistance. Whew! That's a lot to take in, right? All right, so figure A on the left is a normal lung. Figure B on the right is a lung with bronchial asthma. Notice the thick mucus, the mucosal edema, and the smooth muscle spasm. See how it causes obstruction of the small airways. Then breathing becomes labored, and even exhaling is difficult too. Your classic signs for asthma are going to be the dyspnea, wheezing, and coughing. The attack may be gradual, the asthma attack may be gradual, or it can appear abruptly. And it can also occur after a URI. Nighttime coughing is a sign of a very sensitive airway. Wheezing may or may not be heard, depending on how obstructed the airway is. Life-threatening asthma symptoms include the use of accessory muscles to breathe. What are the accessory muscles? Belly breathing, right? Uh, restlessness, severe anxiety, altered mental status due to the hypoxia, inability to say more than a word or two without gasping for a breath, diaphoresis, and cyanosis. Those are life-threatening symptoms. So that is what you should be watching for. Diagnosis is made by medical history and physical exam. Um, oftentimes children who have asthma also have eczema. Um, they may do a f x-ray just to rule out a foreign body, and then they'll do spirometry readings for kids who are greater than five years old. The overall treatment goal of managing asthma is for children to maintain their normal activity levels, have normal pulmonary function, and prevent the chronic symptoms and recurrent exacerbations. Those are our goals. Now, Children with asthma need a detailed plan of how to manage their asthma while they're at home and at, the, at school. That plan needs to be shared with the school nurse and the child's teacher. The plan should outline what meds to use first, second, and when they need to go to the ER. For children with exercise-induced asthma, pre-treating them with a short-acting beta agonist right before PE or recess can help and even prevent an asthma attack. For acute exacerbations, most children will respond to albuterol. Um, they can also try an oral systemic steroid or some inhaled steroids as well. CPT, not going to be beneficial here, so don't even waste your time. Um, allergen control, <laughs> uh, got to tell the family to take care of their roaches and mice. Eliminate smoking. Wood-burning stoves can um, trigger this as well. Try and eliminate damp conditions in the home. Possibly remove the carpet and replace either with tile or wood floors. Medications are generally broken down into two categories, long-term control medicines and quick relief medicines. 
Often children have a prescription for both. Inhaled corticosteroids, chromalin sodium, um, netochromal, and long-acting um, uh, beta-2 agonists, methyl xanthines, and leukotriene moderators are all long-term relief. Those are your long-term meds. Quick relief meds include your beta-2 agonists, anticholinergics, and systemic corticosteroids. Often, asthma meds are given by inhalation through a nebulizer or through inhalation with a spacer for children. If I were you, I would read up and I would look at medications for your exam. Steroids obviously reduce airway inflammation, which can be used to reverse airway obstruction and control symptoms. Inhaled steroids are the first line of treatment for children over the age of five. Oral steroids may take a while, even up to three hours to take effect, with a peak effect in six to 12 hours. So that's really no bueno if you're having an acute asthma attack. You really need either an inhaled steroid, because an oral steroid, not your best bet. Your beta-2 um, agonists, these can be short-acting, um, albuterol, zopinex, terbutaline. These are smooth muscle relaxants. They also help to stabilize mast cells so that they don't release their contents and promote inflammation. These are effective for exercise-induced asthma. They can be given in nebulizer or pill form. Terbutaline can be given sub-Q or even IV. Now, where have we seen terbutaline given before? Think back, it was somewhere in the OB course. We gave terbutaline to moms with preterm labor, right? Because it's a smooth muscle relaxant. Yay, that's right. So it can be used to, um, it causes uterine relaxation, so help stop preterm labor contractions, but it's also used in asthma um, management as well. Obviously anything um, that can be given by nebulizer or inhalation is going to have an effect much faster than anything else. Theophylline used to be given a lot. Now it's mostly given in the ER when the child isn't responding to other therapies. Leukotrienes, um, things like Aculate or Singular, they block the inflammatory and bronchospasm effects. These are good for long-term control, but they're not fast-acting rescue meds. Anticholinergics, Atrovin, Atropine, things like that. These are given for the acute relief of bronchospasm. You want to give them carefully because they can cause blurred vision. They also help dry up respiratory secretions, um, and they cause cardiac and CNS stimulation. The main drug that is used is called, um, it starts with an I, it's I-P-R-A-T-O-P-I-U-M, Ipratopium, I think is how you say it. That's how I'm going to say it at least. Um, and it is good because it does not produce the CNS effects because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Anticholinergics with albuterol are quite effective during an acute attack. There's also something called monoclonal antibodies. Uh, there's a med drug, um, a new drug called Zolaire. It blocks the binding of IgE to mast cells. This effectively prevents the inflammation that causes all the problems to begin with. So this may be the future of asthma management. All right, so your asthma nursing management. There is a great care plan on page 1232 in your book. So you should look over that because it's an absolutely beautiful care plan for treatment and management of a, kid, of a child with asthma. Um, as far as the assessment goes, the physiologic, um, this is your nursing management. You're going to assess their airway, breathing, and circulation. Do your physical exam. Check the pulse ox. Um, if the child is known to have asthma, then you want to find out, you need to do the, uh, check their medication history, history of present illnesses, past illnesses, have they have tried any other alternative medical treatment. Psychosocial, how is the child tolerating this episode? What about the parents? How are they tolerating it? That's an issue in PEDS. Nursing interventions, what is our priority here? Our priority in asthma is airway patency. We have to maintain an open airway. So. How are we going to maintain our airway? Well, we're going to give medications as prescribed. We're going to use those rescue meds. And if we can't, you're going to have to get some help. You're going to have to get some backup. Fluids. Um, adequate hydration is essential to breaking up the mucus plugs. Um, 
you're going to start IV fluids. You're, uh, this is one time we do not give iced beverages because it can actually cause more bronchospasms. I know earlier in this respiratory lecture I said use ice cold fluids, but that's for treatment of sore throat, not for treatment of asthma. And then support family participation. Keep the parents with the child. Let them assist with the treatment, but you have to allow them to take breaks as needed too. Home planning, educate the parents <laughs> when they are well rested. Ha! <laughs> Find some parents in a hospital who are well rested. Good luck with that. But, um, but try and catch them when they're not, you know, falling asleep and totally exhausted. Focus on home management, make referrals as necessary, offer education on how to prevent attacks or eliminate triggers. As far as home maintenance goes, or health maintenance goes, I'm sorry, uh, you definitely want to postpone live virus vaccines if a child has recently had steroids, because what do steroids do? They lower the body's ability to fight infections. They decrease your immunity. So you're not going to give live virus vaccines then. You're also going to monitor the child's growth and development. Teach the child, this is the child and family education, teach the child what to expect and how to prevent attacks. This would be a great thing <clears throat> if anybody's looking for something for their PEDS teaching project, just FYI. It's also important uh, for preventing episodes. Um, Alter the child's home to prevent attacks. Try to eliminate allergens or triggers. It's not possible for some parents to go through and rip out all the carpet in their house and replace it with tile or hardwood. So maybe suggest to them getting a you know high powered vacuum or getting their carpet professionally cleaned or do something to try and eliminate the triggers. Work with parents and do what you can. School management, don't forget to go over the treatment plan with the school nurse so that she knows what meds to give and when. That's a pretty important thing as well. And we've hit our 20 minute limit, so I better stop because you guys are all about to like fall over and, you know, drool on yourselves now because you're so tired of hearing me drone on about asthma. Take a break. We'll be back in a minute. <laughs> 